We welcome you to all to join us today to worship. It is a great way we have to learn to use the technology available to us. I want to share a few verses from Psalm 125 with you. Psalm 125 verses 1 and 2. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Let us come together in prayer. Gracious God, you who surprise us with new experiences, especially through this time of the coronavirus, we have learned how to care for one another using the technology available in the world today. We come with reverence to praise and adore you. You are so magnificent, it is beyond our comprehension. Yet you love and care for each of us. Thank you, Lord God. We pray for all those who are finding it difficult in this time. We pray your comfort and support that they may know that you understand. Help us to be attentive to your word as shared by Johnson this morning and may we be ready to do whatever you ask of us. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I now ask Bill to come and give us the reading for this morning. Good morning, everybody. Our reading this morning is from the Old Testament and right at the beginning from Genesis chapter 25 verses 19 to 34 and this is a story about Jacob and Esau this is the account of Abraham's son Isaac Abraham became the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Aram and sister of Laban the Aramean Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. The one will be stronger than the other and the other the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished, and he said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. That is why he is also called Edom. Jacob replied, First tell me, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. I'll now call on Reverend Johnson to come and give his message. Good morning, church. We want to thank you for giving your time to listen to the message of God today on Sunday. What a wonderful day God has given us. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we might not be sitting by the lake today, However, as these crowds eagerly gathered to listen to the stories and truth you told them, we too wait your word to us. With joy in our hearts and anticipation, we pray that you will give us listening ears and hearts open to receive your love 
your teaching, and your wisdom. Help our lives to be full of bursting and bearing your fruit. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful time that you have given us as we gathered in our own homes, listening to the word of God. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My theme today is don't sell your inheritance for a cabbage or soup. Don't sell your inheritance for cabbage soup. The text of Genesis 25 verse 19 to 34 gives us a look at the five persons. One, Isaac, who was the Abraham's son. Rebekah, Isaac's wife. Esau, older twin. And Jacob, the younger twin. And most important of all, the Lord. The verses tell us of the family of Isaac and Rebekah. The fact that was that Rebecca had not conceived a child in their 20 years of marriage. This was much of concern for the early biblical family, early biblical women, Rebecca, and of course to her husband Isaac. Listen to the lessons in this story. Isaac was the late in life child of Abraham and Sarah. When he became a man, he married Rebecca. It was not romance that brought them together. Rebekah was chosen by a representative of Abraham, Isaac's father, because he was of the right family, the right nation, the right age, and in the right place. On paper, it was a great match. Isaac was a child of promise, and Rebekah was of good stock. The two young people from good families married and set about to raise a family. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that easily. They were barren and to rely on prayer and their faith in God for children. The lesson, of course, is that nothing has changed since then. Even with all our technology, advances in medicine, and the help of the best child psychologist, we still must rely on prayer and put our trust in God if we are going to have a family and a successful raise that family. Children, after all, are a gift from God, not the result of scientific happenstance. Successful raising children is always more a matter of God's grace than of good technique. So from the onset of that pregnancy, there was problems. Rebecca conceived twins, and those twins, two boys, fought with one another, even in the womb. About the ninth month of her pregnancy, Rebecca from that nice family in Padam Aram blurted her frustration. If it is to be this way, why do I live? In verse 22. I suspect man is the mother who has made so, this same uh, comment during a difficult pregnancy. In Rebecca's case, this only foreshadowed what was to come among, between his two children. She had twins, boys. The first son was born with a reddish color and was given the name Esau, which means red. The second son was said to have entered the world holding on to his twin brother's heel. His name was named Jacob. A play word for the hill. So the Bible does not provide an ab abundance of details from their growing up years, but it does tell us these boys were very different. The eldest twin, Esau, was an outdoors man who loved to hunt and fish. As the eldest son, he was also his father's heir. Esau was to receive twice the inheritance of his brother as well as the mentor of a clan leadership. Jacob, on the other hand, didn't like hunting and fishing. He thought putting worms on hooks and skinning rabbits is distasteful labor. Instead, he liked to stay home and help his mother around the tent. Consequently, Jacob was the favorite of his mother, Rebecca. She expressed that favoritism regularly. She even helped Jacob trick Isaac on old man's deathbed and warned him with, when Esau came looking for revenge. We have here the markings of a dysfunctional family. They simply engage in too much undercutting and trigger to raise health children. As might be predicted, the kids have serious behavior and attitude problem, which you can see. So for instance, the Bible makes no attempt to conceal the fact that Jacob, among other things, is downright sneaky. He takes advantage of his old blind father. He calls his uncle Laban out of everything from his daughters to his lifestyle. He outwits his brother Esau. 
There is dark power at work in Jacob. He insists, he grabs, he exploits. That, of course, is the focus of this morning's lesson. The twins are young adults. Esau spent the day hunting with his father. Jacob spent the day at home cooking stew. For lack of a better description, let's call it cabbage soup. Esau comes from the field about 4 p.m. in the afternoon and is hungry. The smell of that soup fills the tent. He asks his mother for a bowel just to tide him over until dinner. Jacob after offers a deal. If Esau will consign his birthright to Jacob, he can have a bowl of cabbage soup. So several doors animate from this story other than cooking cabbage. First, take note of the audacity. Those boys had no right to better the family birthright. Law, tradition, and Abraham made that decision. Again, this is not the healthiest of families and not the most mature of children. When queried, Jacob established the price of a bowl of cabbage soup at the family birthright. Esau thinks for just a split of a second, I am about to die of hunger. What use is the birthright to me? Is it of any use? I, I think I don't need a birthright. Contrary to what he claimed, Esau was not at the age of starvation. He was hungry, but he was not experiencing hunger. His stomach was not banging against the spinal column. He only had to wait two hours until dinner. Even though Esau and Jacob were twins, Esau held the honor of being the older son. As such, he automatically received an abundant blessing that were denied to the other children of the family. The elder son received a double portion of the family's estate. He also inherited any position of titles of his fathers. And since Isaac was in a covenant relationship with God, this was also part of Esau's inheritance. But Esau seems to have been spiritually dull. He did not value these blessings at all. In contrast to Jacob, who bent with an ambition to inherit all of his father's blessings, Esau didn't care one way or the other. He didn't care of what it means to have inheritance. And so it came to pass that the birthright of the Hebrew people passed through Jacob and not his older brother. It happened because one man on one day didn't know the difference between hungry and hunger. He didn't know that, the difference. Esau immediately agrees, and in doing so, he makes light of God's covenant. His role in bearing that covenant into future generations, and his role as head of family and tribe. Esau is only interested in immediate gratification. But the responsibility of the firstborn son requires patience, endurance, wisdom, commitment to the covenant relationship, and all that requires it. If he had only stayed hungry, he might have had salon steak for dinner. Instead, he settled for cabbage soup. Esau, because Esau was not able to discipline present ones, he sacrificed his future possibilities just because he wanted to eat there and there. That fellow's lack of present discipline cost him dearly. He sold his birthright for a bowel of cabbage soup. What happens regularly in a multitude of ways? Without present discipline, future possibilities are sacrificed by our own families, by our own children. Esau could not keep his eye on the future because his attention was too rooted in the here and now. He is shallow and he is bound to the clay from which he is made, Adama, from which he is made of soil. But you know, we live in a kind of Esau-like culture, don't we? People in our culture are exhausted. They are depleted by the tumor going on in our culture. They are hungry for something more. Their hunger pangs such today that they will give up anything and everything to fuel themselves, even if that feeling will take in that's good for us in any sense of the word. People die for that. We are sailing in a sea of self-gratification. How can we be Christian, worship God, deepen our faith when we are surrounded by a culture of self and immediate gratification? Certainly, our world has no, no shortage of fillers that we can partake of or try to fill that internal hunger. It has got full. Shopping, material things, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, politics, agendas, issues, AIDS. We have such a stew of things to choose from, don't we? A red, red, red stew of stuff that is just boiling over in our own culture. And often we are boiling hot to try some of them, aren't we? Because these are the quick fix to happiness. 
You grab this, you go everywhere. Today, people, when they have money, they don't think even of saving. They just want to bring, uh, grab every item they can find. In any shop, in any supermarket, it's just grabbing. Some of the things they did, they don't even use when you find them. Esau was not the first or the last on the earth to make such a trade. How often all of us trade what really matters for something or far less value. When you see someone driving an 80,000 car dollar, but they tell you they don't have time to spend with their children or their spouse. Or you are talking to someone who has sold his birthright for a bar of stew. When somebody tells you they don't have time for the things of God to read the Bible or to be in worship, you are talking to someone who has sold his birthright for a bar of stew. How far will the epidemic spread? It is hard to say. There are so many cases even today. Are you one of them? Do you hate your birthright? Do you feel gypped? Do you resent the body you received? Your face, your intelligence, your lack of intelligence, your background, your inheritance, your lack of inheritance. People are despising. They dislike who they are made of. They try to change even their face, which God has created them and given them. Never sell yourself short. You have enormous potential. You, after all, a loved child of God. This is your birthright and it comes with enormous possibility. Unfortunately, to most potential doesn't have much present market value. You can't see it. One of life's most demanding skills is learning to stay hungry today in order to realize tomorrow's possibilities. As much as we might like it otherwise, everything in this life doesn't happen when we want it to happen. It happens the other way. Learn to stay hungry in the pursuit of fourth one. Accept that you are not going to fulfill every material and professional goal immediately. Understand that most things worth accomplishing take time. Many times they take decades. Learn to stay a little hungry. To take, it can take such a difference in your life. For one thing, stay hungry for knowledge. Infant, develop a deep hunger for knowledge. Too many people want to quit learning because they reach a certain age. A lot of young people today, they don't even envy to go on with their education. After even year 10, some drop out of school. But I'm saying learn to develop a hunger for knowledge. Don't, do, don't quit. Do that. Keep on thinking. Keep on doing the good thing. Learn to stay hungry, not only for information, but for God. Unlike other institutions, we never graduate from Sunday school because we never learn all we need to know about our faith. Never let your beliefs harden to concrete. Be open to grow in your faith. You never know when God is going to confront you with a new idea and a new set of circumstances. Because he's God. He is possible to bring any new miracles, new happens in your life. When that happens, your faith can be stretched to such a new limit. It can never shrink back to the same size it was before. Stay hungry for God. Stay hungry now. Leave us open to future possibilities. Develop a, a deep hunger for life. Remember, this is true. The best time in your life is wherever you are right now. After all, today is the only day of your life over which you have any say. Therefore, believe today is the best and make the best of today. And that is very important for you. Life will, however, get even better wherever it takes you tomorrow. If you continue to believe that possible, God has created us in such a way that every age has its special problems and its special joys. God gives us the strength to deal with the problems as we encounter them. He also provides the grace to make the most of the joys. Don't swallow in guilt over yesterday. It is forgiven. Don't worry about the darkness of what is to come. There will be light enough to get it through. Live in the fullness of today and stay hungry for tomorrow. And that is very important for you to know. What does it mean? The Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 33, 34, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow we will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So why should we worry about what is coming on? What a difference that attitude can make. If you, if your life unfold day by day like a beautiful flower, is your God-given birthright, don't sell it for a cabbage of soup. Don't ever sell the life that God has given you for a cabbage of soup. Because Esau did, couldn't wait for dinner. The history of Israel is traced through Jacob, not through Esau. Because he was the oldest son 
who should have maybe the history to be traced through him, but now is being traced through the younger son. Obviously, Israel is no rocket scientist. Jacob constantly took advantage of him. Physically, he never made it as a male model. His entire body was covered with thick red hair. I am sure the, the kids in school constantly tormented him about that. His mother liked his brother best. This kid, Israel, had some serious problems. He had very reason to be a miserable failure in life. Surely, any failure he experienced could be attributed to circumstances beyond his control. Therefore, lies in a wonderful lesson. Your birthright is the same. You are the loved child of God. You are worthwhile. Don't relinquish that gift to anyone. Circumstances may not be easy. You have grown up in a dysfunctional home like Esau. You may not be a particularly gifted person. Others may take advantage of you, as did Esau. Your mother may not like you. Rebecca didn't like Esau. You may encounter one problem right after another, as Esau did. But you are God's loved child. You are worthwhile. That's your birthright. You can rise above anything. Believe that and live as though you believe it. Only Jesus can renew your life, quench your thirst, quell your pangs of hunger for a life beyond your reach. I just want to urge you this morning, will you live only for the moment? Care more about food and money than meaning and purpose. Value or devalue it. It's your birthday. It's your birthright. Think about it. It's your birthright. You need to treasure it. It's very important. You need to treasure it. It's very important for you. So please don't sell your birthright for cheaper things. You are important. You are a child of God. May God bless you as you think about it, what you are about to sell, and sell not. May the good Lord bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we pray that today for all the people given the grace of spreading your gospel. We pray for the church worldwide, but in particular in this place where people are still suffering from COVID-19. People are still afraid even of going out, even of meeting in church buildings. We pray for our ministers. We pray for the government. We pray for those who care for other people who are elderly. We pray that you give them the heart to support others. Lord God, help us to identify the people around us who wants to be supported by us, who wants to receive the best from us. We pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, we should never be in a position of selling our birthright for cheaper things, only for a short time, only within seconds. Help us to view life, the possibilities of life in the future. Father, help us. In your name I pray. Amen. I will call Bill to come and uh, do the prayer for our offerings. Thank you. We bring our offering to the Lord. Gracious God, your truth is a lamp shining in the darkness of this world's confusion and a fire burning in the coldness of human need. Let this offering of ours and the dedication of our hearts, minds and souls be used to strengthen and brighten the warm our world and to bring you everlasting praise and glory. Amen. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.